Thank you, everybody who's helped organize these, all the tech crew. You've been brilliant the last few days. Um, so welcome, everyone. This is going to be uh, just a yummy discussion about the importance and place. You know, the challenge and the delights faced by a filmmaker as they try to assimilate a location. Maybe it's an institution, maybe it's a small community, maybe it's a large city. But their task, when they decide, when they're bitten by that fever to make a film, is to come into a place, into an arena, and absorb it. And some, oh, I've got tug here going on. <laughs> and absorb the color, the lights, the tastes of a place, to think about the noise and the chaos, but also the stillness of a place, to capture that and then share it with an audience. And it, you know, an audience who may never know this place may never go there. So it's actually, it's a huge charge and responsibility. And we have three brilliant filmmakers to have this conversation with who have taken on such incredibly different places, if you will, from the world's largest scientific complex, hidden underground, you know, beneath the rural landscape of, of pristine Switzerland. We've got a, a tiny, fragile community in rural America clinging on for dear life. And then we've got the chaos of one of the largest city, noisiest, most uh, mm -hmm. volatile cities in the world. So what we're going to do is get, hear a little bit from them about how and why and what's the attraction to those places and how it is that you tease that out, you evoke that. Now, we're a very small group, so everyone is, you've got to think of at least <laughs> one question each, an intelligent question <laughs> to ask these good people, so you're charged with that. First of all, we're going to do a little game, which you're going to tell us about your films in a minute, but everyone's got to go around and say, where you were, this is about place, where you were born, where you live now, and any curious places that you came via if you know what I mean. I'm going to begin to give you the clues. Okay, so I was born in a really, what we'd call a chavy, nasty little town in the east of England called Chelmsford in Essex. I now live in what, you know, very middle-class suburban West London. And I came via... Oh, okay, my mum had a string of boy, boyfriends and we ended up kind of migrating to places. I lived in southern Portugal for a while the middle of Norway for a little bit, a little bit of Brussels, so a bit of a nomadic childhood. So, yeah, Chavi, East England, via a bit of <laughs> Europe, and then landed in very suburban West London. Okay, you. I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, but I remember nothing about it because I moved as a young, uh, when I was very young. Uh, grew up mostly in a suburb of Philadelphia, Yardley, Pennsylvania, New Hope area, um, but then left after uh, high school. I uh, was in uh, New England for college and then really spent the bulk of my life in Berkeley, California, where I had gone to study physics and somehow ended up a filmmaker instead um, and uh, ended up in Berkeley for most of that the last 30 years, but I moved to New York City seven years ago and uh, moved to New York City and then spent a lot of time in Geneva making this film. <laughs> Love New York City, though? Are we, love are we New like, York City. Love New York love, City. I mean, love the fact that going to Geneva is a lot quicker from New York City than Berkeley. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Logistics, very important. <laughs> Sharif. Uh, I was born in Los Angeles. Again, don't remember it. Moved when I was two to Ohio, Cincinnati. I was there until I was seven. Moved to Cairo, which was a big culture shock. Was there until I was 18, 19. And back to Boston or went to school in Boston, and then moved to south to New York. And in that time, a little bit of Australia. Oh, and uh, okay. so family's still in Cairo, and I'm kind of splitting my time between New York and Cairo. Fascinating. Tracy. I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, as an infant actually moved to Columbia, Missouri, oh. where my mother finished her graduate oh. studies. Yes. Um, and then... Uh, primarily grew up in Northern California. Uh -huh. um, my mother was um, working very hard and I um, was uh, an only child and when school was out, I would get shipped to Rich Hill, Missouri actually, uh, to spend every summer with my grandparents and every winter break. So I feel like I was sort of doing this thing where I was living in Northern California in the Bay Area, the really? East Bay. Oh, where? Hilgis, uh, between Alcatraz and Woolsey. Oh, oh Berkeley, <laughs> really, Berkeley. I know well, exactly Oakland, where. Well, Oakland, on the Oakland-Berkeley oh, border. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so anyway, um, and, uh, and then I went to boarding school outside of Boston. Do they have those here? 
Yeah. They do, and they, they do. Still, and then, we only have that particular form of cruelty in England. Yeah. <laughs> I went to uh, college uh, outside of Chicago uh, in Evanston and uh, then moved to L.A. to go to graduate school, film school, and, um, and never left. Huh. So I was going to start with you, Tracy, just to dip into this incredible movie, Rich Hill. And my first question was going to be about your personal connection, but you have just completely <laughs> set that up. But I'm serious. Was this a film then that was, you know, destiny? That was in your bones. You had to come back and tell that story of this place. Yes, yes, very much. I mean, I had deep, deep connection with this community and with this place, um, and a, you know, and a, and a strange relationship with it because I w was both insider and outsider. So, mm. both um, someone who would, um, you know, trying to understand it, wanting to be deeply a part of it um, and never never quite always being a little on the outside of it and always an observer and for those who haven't seen rich hill yet we're just going to take a look at a little clip and then we're going to dive on in okay, okay. People think that we're poor around here, but the definition of poor is no roof, no lights, no water, no food. We have lights, we have water, we have a roof, we have food, we have money. We're not poor. I gotta show you all my battle scars with this helmet. That's how you tell someone's good. I was thinking about moving to China. Thinking about moving to China and becoming an art teacher. Right now, my mom's in prison. She's been in since July, so about nine months. Letter to my mom. The most important thing for you is your education. The most important fit thing for me is my family. That's all I need. Trick or treat. Yeah, I guess God brought me back here for a reason. I really do love my mom and my dad and my sister. I've been praying since I was about five years old. Nothing's came, but that ain't gonna stop me. This is what goes through my mind. God has to be busy with everyone else. Eventually, he will come into my life and help me. I hope it happens. It's gonna break my heart if it don't. People who haven't been to see that, I'm gonna bore you all with all three of these films. Please go, please take the time. It's tender and poetic and, you know, oozing with sense of place and space. D why this town? Why this town in particular? Well, it's, it's um, I, I made this with my first cousin. Oops, we are tethered here. Um, <laughs> Pinned back. Uh, yeah, let me keep my good posture. Um, uh, and this was a place that we love. I mean, we have a deep, deep, um, connection to, but also saw it struggling, and, and I saw it more so over my lifetime, because um, I've been going there longer, um, and I, I really wanted to understand what was happening and what it was like for the families that were struggling there, so that was why this place, and, and this was a story, I think, also at its heart that wouldn't have been told had <coughs> had we not told it, you know, and that was, this wasn't like, and on anybody's radar, and, and once, once um, we got there and met the families um, and found the heart of our story, I mean, place, place was the inspiration, but, um, but it was kind of a vehicle to then um, find something that was less of a nostalgia piece. And you know, as I've, I think I've said this, you know, meditation on a pile of bricks and more, you know, something that had 
universal relevance and kind of transcended mm. the, the specific place. Yeah. Really interesting, because as you say, so easy to fall into the trap of making a piece of poverty porn at some level, you know <laughs> what I mean? I mean, and it, it absolutely doesn't do that. If, if you sit here now and you think of kind of a word cloud um, that, that conjures in your mind, when you think of that just as a piece of physical landscape, what, what comes to your mind in terms of, is it about light, is it about color, is it about about about, the, about Rich Hill, yeah, about, about this Rich place Hill. that I... What does it, you know, what does I mean, it for, for me, there, there are things that transcend what, what one is able to do with... Um, uh, with imagery, which is, and so part of it is smell, you know, there's a smell of this community in this place and the, the, the cut grass and there's sounds. I think we were able to do that a lot with our sound design, which was very important when we would spend a lot of time actually closing our eyes, listening to the sounds of the crickets or the things that, that um, were really so, so sounds corny, but so rich about this place. Um, so, I mean, for me, it was warmth, and and um, those are non-specific words, but, no, not, um, but smells. You can feel that, though. That's why it's lovely yeah. to hear you say it. You can feel that oozing from the film. Yeah, I mean, it's dimension. You know, it was really it was experiential to be there, and to and be, for me, I mean, I would get to kind of it's like a compare and contrast. I would be in much more of a of a uh, urban setting and very different environment, and then get to go there. And to just feel that and coming off, you know, coming off a plane or, you know, coming out of the car was always really wonderful to get there. I'm mindful that a lot of those um, beautiful landscape shops, they don't come easy, they don't come for free. There's a lot of very early mornings or late nights. There's a lot of patience. <laughs> and Wendy, can you talk a little bit about being patient and waiting for the shot? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I feel a bit strange not being here with my wonderful co-director, first cousin, but, um, because he's a brilliant cinematographer and I think, you know, his, it, we wouldn't, um, uh, in large part capturing these images was, was due to his, um, incredible eye and ability to listen, um, with the camera. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, have, we had 450 hours of footage and, and a lot of that was spent in homes with our subjects, but a lot of that was also spent in this place where we were you know, waiting for trains in the bushes and um, uh, you know, seeing birds <laughs> and pulling over and stopping and spending time with the birds um, and catching the seasons. Um, because it was important to uh, take people to this place. And we wanted them to experience it as we did, if we could, um, what we loved about it, and not just um, the kind of shock value of some of the deprivation that was also a part of the film, you know, not just the poverty porn. Any questions right now for Tracy? Is anyone in the room who wants to jump in straight away? Sir? Oh, do, do we need to wait for a mic? Sorry. God, I can't even turn around. I'm going to lean. Thank you so much. Okay. I was at the last um, panel and it was about technology in part. Were you able, was this shot on film or were you using digital Technology, do you feel, and if you did use digital, do you feel that the digital allows you to spend more time with the subjects and be, get the the moments that you need to really make it work? Would it? And if you had been shooting on film, how would that have made it different? Yeah. Well, we we um, we did not shoot on film, but we did shoot on um, uh, the red scarlet which was an expensive decision, you know, somewhere in between, I think, a camera that is often used for documentaries and film because it's 4K footage and it's, um, it's when you shoot 450 hours, you have to think about storage and that's very complicated because it's a lot of, to store and it becomes very expensive. So um, uh, you need to be mindful of that if you care at all about your budget, which of course as an independent filmmaker, I think we, we all do and need to. Um, 
but it was a choice very early on in part because we we wanted these rich um, images of, of and we wanted it to be beautiful um, and this camera allowed us to capture more beautiful images and it was kind of scary but it was an intention early on that we needed to do this, so we took that leap and, you know, shot on a red. Can I ask that question of the other two directors about technology? Did you make conscious choices? I mean, a lot of time we don't have that privilege, and it's like, whatever's available or free this week, I'll take it. But did you, did you both, how did you both approach that in your cases? Uh, I started off with a really nice camera, and again, um, sort of in relation to the place. Initially, I was uh, legitimate in that I had a press pass and I was allowed to be standing where I was, so therefore the camera was big and had the microphone. But then um, there was a point in my shooting where suddenly it became a little bit more dangerous to be out there, and I, I did not have the credentials to be out there. Yes. So the camera, just by default, had to turn into something smaller, something that looked less professional. Um, and even still, you know, the second someone sees a microphone on your camera, then they instantly they assume... They know you're not taking stills anymore. And you're not <laughs> taking stills. So it really was, I mean, the camera I used was in relation to the city and the times and what was happening. And I always had a scarf that would kind of wrap it and had to at times act like it was a baby. But um, I mean, I really, it wasn't what camera do I want to use? Instead, it was, what can, what I? can I use? <laughs> right, without going to prison. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, how about you? Well, we started with a big HD camera also. I mean, we made the decision. We knew we were going to be mixing interviews and Verite stuff, and uh, that um, we would use something that, uh, especially for the interviews, looked very good. Uh, we didn't really feel we could go up to the red. But did you stick with the red the whole time, actually? Yeah, wow. wow. It's purity. Um, yeah, that's great. <laughs> so we started with that. But then, actually, in our case, it became a real mix of things. Actually, intentionally, from the beginning, one component of the film is that we gave our characters just little um, HDV cameras, and we sort of blog cameras, and so the idea was that they would record themselves at any you know a momentous things that happened when I didn't happen to be there. In particular, a lot of our uh, filming was in Geneva, where this big experiment took place, and things could have happened and did happen um, when I wasn't there, and so they would just record themselves, and so that was a very you know, and it has a different look. We liked that different look, so it was in integrated into the film right from the beginning. Um, also, we had to deal with a lot of the issues of you know different film rates and cameras in Europe, and I had a, a number of people that filmed things for me there as well, and so. We ended up having a, whole, a huge spectrum of yeah. just everything from you know a really big HD camera to I have one thing where somebody recorded himself on a laptop, you know. <laughs> so um, it was a sort of a nightmare in post, but it, it actually ended up not being as bad as I thought. But we had to mix it all together, and uh, I think it was essential to the film to have all those different capabilities, just because some of the things were happening in you know very quickly that we had to respond to. We couldn't get a crew together right away or something like that. Yeah, super smart. Any other questions before we dive a little deeper into CERN? Okay. So Mark, if I might switch to you for a minute. So we're going from exquisite rural America to, well, arguably exquisite <laughs> Switzerland. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know how many of you have been there. It's very green. There are beautiful mountains. It's very civilized, very safe, and yet underground somehow. I don't know how they persuaded them to put the world's biggest, most expensive, extraordinary science experiment right underneath. I mean, it's sort of amazing that it's there. Um, did you know CERN well before? I mean, had you been there? Had you been inside before you started making this movie, or was it just the stuff? No, I had never been there. I mean, uh, I mean, it is interesting because I studied physics, so I got a doctorate in physics, but that was like 30 years ago. So I was familiar with the idea and you know, with the experiment, but it wasn't being even built then. And so when I started, uh, um, it was the first time I went there, and, and of course, like, I, I don't know if this happened with you guys, but you know, what became our first shoot uh, was just barely getting ready in time for a big event. So you know, this was starting up, 
and we had to sort of get it together. And so we have, uh, there's, there's sort of two components in our film. One is the theoretical physicists who are actually mostly in the US. But then the experiment is in Geneva. And that's the place that sort of determined it. And that has their own schedule. You know, it's not, I'm not, as a filmmaker, you don't tell them when to start, they tell <laughs> you. And so uh, the first time I went over was the first time I saw it, actually. And in fact, I couldn't see the actual experiment the first time because it was already starting to run. And when it was running, you can't go down. So it's underground. I mean, the experiment itself is underground. It's a huge 17-mile ring underground. How deep is it down? 300 feet below. It's underneath Switzerland and France. It goes through the mountains. I mean, it's sort of a, a, this amazing uh, collaboration. Um, so all we can really see is the above sur structure, which is, it looks like a campus, you know, not, not a beautiful campus either. <laughs> and, um, and control rooms. Um, and... It wasn't until uh, the machine was turned off at a certain point later that I could actually go down and see it. Can I um, talk about that moment for a minute? Because, I mean, it is a little, people who haven't seen it yet, it's a little bit like kind of lifting the lid on the Star Trek Enterprise saying, you know, what's on <laughs> I mean, it is, it's so big and so complex. I, when I first saw that, I was like, wow, how did you wrap your head? I mean, literally about how to film this, how to capture the enormity and complexity of this beast um, and commit it to, to film. I mean, genuinely, I felt kind of a bit overwhelmed. And also <laughs> because you haven't got the benefit of being in a big landscape where I can get like way back. I mean, you're right. confined in a building. Yeah. No, it is. It's a, it's a technological, <laughs> the experiment's a technological achievement and filming it is also uh, very difficult. I mean, um, and also because you can only go down at certain times and you are very much concerned with it. I mean, it's interesting. Can you give an idea of the scale for these people? Like, um, you... Well, it's like a seven story tall building underground. So it's the biggest, I mean, well, the experiment itself is, is, is a huge ring, and they, they circulate these protons around the ring near the speed of light. And what they do is they collide them at four points. And at those four points where they collide them, they build these huge detectors. That's what the experiments really are. That's the big, big and Those you know, are like thing. chambers, right? And they're, they're, yeah, so uh, the, I think the Atlas one, which is the one we focused on, is the biggest underground cavity basically, that, that, that has ever been built. Uh, and, you know, they, they assemble parts of it up on the ground, they lower it through these tubes, and then they assemble it there. And it's, um, you know, it's like a seven-story Swiss watch. And so that's the thing that they, they, they talk about. It's, a, it's huge, but as one of our characters says, the amazing thing is that, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's many buildings higher than seven stories, but, you know, they're mostly filled with, you know, beams and rebar and space. Um, with this thing, with this, at this detector, every, every little micrometer is detailed and planned out. They use, like, miniature soldering irons, and so it's, you know, seven stories of a Swiss watch, which is what really makes it amazing. And um, you, you are somewhat limited. We had the advantage, though, that they have been filming it for years. And so one component of the film that was indispensable was we had access to their footage. And so in various stages of construction, they had a little more access. Um, and so we could use some of that footage. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it, you know, the practicality of it is when I actually saw it for the first time, we were... It was a sort of a design scene in the sense that we were following some kids around who were going to see it for the first time. And so I was very much concerned with the practicalities of, you know, getting it in. Is it in frame? Do we have it? You know, worrying about the technology. And uh, I actually became, where it really struck me what an amazing achievement was, was um, when it was down after there was an accident and I was looking at things in detail and then looking at the very tiny little detailed wiring and everything, and I thought, oh, my God, this is amazing. What did it, I mean, th what did you feel, though? I mean, was it, I, mean I felt awe yeah, watching. Yeah, it is I mean, awe. I, I, yeah. I felt awe. I, it's not really comprehensible that we've made something like that. It's astonishing that it worked. I mean, it really is. And um, you have to realize, I mean, this is an experiment. It took, uh, you know, 20 years. They were working on this for 20 years, which means that you are speculating on the technology that's going to be available at that point. So you don't have the, <laughs> the magnets that work, right, that are of that caliber, the optics, the, the um, you know, superconducting magnets and things like that. So you're, you're making this 
design with a leap of faith that you're going to be up to that level as you're going along because it's such a long-term project. I mean, it's like the cathedrals. I mean, in a sense, you know, ho thankfully not as long as the cathedrals to, to, to make, but that sort of thing that you're making a commitment that, you know, it's, in fact, it's just about the limit in which one generation can do something and see the result. Should we take a look? Mm. Yeah. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's coming out. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to everybody on the panel. If I could just ask you all to remain seated just for a few minutes. In exploration, there needs to be the set of people who have no rules, and they are going into the frontier. I've never heard of a moment in history where an entire field is hinging on a single event. The Large Hadron Collider, the biggest machine ever built, is finally going to turn on. You take two things and you smash them together. You get a lot of stuff out of that collision and you try to understand that stuff. Could be nothing other than just understanding everything. Little did I know when I started that the experiments would take 30 years, and here I am still not knowing. I really want to know the truth. The first time I ever saw it, I can remember walking in and just being stunned, like five stories completely filled with custom design, hand soldered, microelectronics. There are 10,000 people, over 100 nationalities. Ciao, ciao. 100,000 computers deal with the data. In fact, the World Wide Web was invented at CERN so that physicists could share the data. This is really my generation's only shot. Let's get started, everybody. Now comes the day of reckoning. Given the complexity, they're already about a week or two behind. We're saying that all their tools are breaking. It begs the question, what are the risks? It would be a catastrophe for physics. This helium leak, uh, really frustrating. You've got magnets sheared off their jack. Completely catastrophic. We're at a fork in the road, and it's cranking up the suspense as much as it possibly can. We may discover additional space dimension, the mystery and the origin of the universe. We may be at the end of the road. The entire control room is like a group of six-year-olds whose birthday is next week. It's incredible that it's happened in my lifetime. Whatever we learn is going to have a dramatic impact on the way human beings think about the universe forever. It's totally brilliant, if you haven't seen it, and funny, <laughs> really funny. Who knew scientists were that funny? Yeah. <laughs> I did, but I'm glad you that knew, everybody else did. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let, yeah, let me take you back to that first time getting inside CERN. Was there another particular challenge maybe with your project? Actually, maybe there are some similarities. It was about restriction and limitation to how far you can move around and actually... You know, you there were a set of constraints which are both practical and logistical. How did you know? Well, there were you... constraints in terms of being able to be down there. First of all, when it's running, you can't go down there. In fact, um, this sort of amusing uh, uh, aspect is that uh, Angels and Demons, the film, the big Angels and Demons film, ostensibly starts at CERN, um, and uh, they went over there and they did all their research. But then they found out that you can't really be down there filming when the thing is running. And so, of course, you know, what's Hollywood's answer is, well, we'll just build one ourselves, you know? <laughs> of course, you know, you don't actually build a $10 billion machine, so, uh, they, but they built something that was a mock-up so that they could have a glass panel so that the scientists could sit there and going, oh, wow, I see it's, you know, steam's coming off, you know? Which, of course, you know, if any physicist was down there, he would be steam himself. Um, so, you, you know, the, I mean, access, the access was limited in terms of I could only go down there at certain times when it wasn't working. And, and, you know, um, we did have some, one amusing thing is that uh, even though it's off when you're down there, uh, we went down at one point and my uh, cinematographer just was like, oh my gosh, something is going crazy. My viewfinder is going on wild and my zoom is going nuts. And, you know, everything is ostensibly off, but we are in the presence of the most powerful magnets in the universe. <laughs> and so we were trying to figure out what could this be and eventually it sort of, you know, fixed itself. Uh, but of course, my nightmare was, oh my gosh, like, did everything get erased? I mean, because this is the disadvantage of not being on, on film. 
And uh, luckily it was all there, but it was a very scary moment that we had to deal with. And, and in fact, the, one of the physicists we were with was talking about the fact that they had an instance where the guy who's in, in charge of, of uh, uh, the safety, magnetic safety, had gone down there with his laptop and um, had put it down next to a magnet. And he completely erased all of his data, actually. So uh, luckily, I was told that after we had recovered. But, um, you know, you are dealing with something, you know, that's this big uh, technological thing. And, um, you know, you have to think about how you're going to fit it in there, and but have to work with a schedule. I mean, that's different. I guess there is no schedule in Cairo, right. presumably. Yeah. So or, right. uh, you were probably filming whenever you wanted also. So uh, we had place and time restrictions in that regard. Anyone want to jump in just at the second? Now you've seen that clip. Looks pretty good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, another question. Go on for it, sir. Because frankly, these people are not pulling their weight. So you go ahead. <laughs> and pretty soon we're going to start asking them questions. Yeah, no exactly. pressure. No pressure. I just have to, to ask about the, it's what focal length, sorry it's technical, but like a super wide angle, you know, I no. shoot mainly still, and it is a problem whenever you're trying to do equipment for people and you're in a room. How wide a lens did you have to use, or were you able to use in there in degrees of field? We, we didn't use a real wide one. We, we, we mostly stuck with a, a general purpose lens that actually could use both because uh, we had to be adapting to... Uh, whatever. Whatever, exactly. So we were not, yeah, changing it. Oh, second question. <laughs> um, all of you have different aspects of um, being able to get into people's lives, places, and locations. So getting the access, was that difficult in different formats? I mean, probably all sorts of forms to sign, but, you know, ho people's homes and lives. And sounds like a little political issues and life-threatening for yourself. <laughs> So uh, how hard was that, and is it just a lot of hoops? Tracy, but do you want to start and we'll work up the sound? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I, um, I, we cast a rather wide net at first, and, you know, we were interested really in a, in a place first. Um, but because of our connection, because, you know, my grandmother taught everybody third grade, and my grandfather was the mail carrier, um, they knew us, and it was, you know, it's a town of 1,300 people. So um, it was, there was some trust kind of just across the board um, at the beginning. But then, you know, you walk into a home and you've got a camera and what are the intentions and what does it mean to be in a documentary and what, um, so um, uh, part of it was just a, just a getting to know our families and in large part they were hugely welcoming um, and hugely wanting their voice to be heard and their stories to be told. So that was, that was pretty, um, you know, that, that meant our access was, <laughs> you know, um, pretty clear. Um, and it was Im important for me as a filmmaker to, to have that intimate personal access. Those are the stories that resonate with me is when you can get as close as possible. And, um, and it means that you really are in a privileged place to tell a story that wouldn't otherwise be told and ought to be told then. You know. Sharif, how about you? Uh, very much like Tracy, I think that I initially responded to the place and I really wanted the city. I mean, this is, was my main character from the beginning. And I just thought, this is what I have to show. And, uh, and to me, it was sort of like, this is this city and the... The, the, the roads were sort of the veins and the pulse of the city. Um, as far as access, it was really, I mean, I spent a lot of time just sitting on the side of the road in coffee shops, just kind of with all my equipment right here, just kind of waiting and listening. And I think that's what most filmmakers do, is you just sort of wait and listen and see where you have an opportunity and what exactly you're trying to do. And there were lots of plans that were made, which instantly got canceled because this access or that access. So I think it was, it was really, I mean, I feel that my film is very much me responding to the city and the city kind of responding to me. And again, with everyone that you meet, the first question is what are you filming and why? 
and I always thought that traffic was a very uh, kind of non-political thing to talk about, and because it was everyone's story, they instantly felt like, oh, I've got a story for you. Oh, I can, you know, I, I have something to add, because there we all are, and it's just this, uh, you know, we're all in it together. And how about you? I mean, were permissions presumably a nightmare? Actually, Michael? surprisingly not. I can't um, believe that. Yeah, no, it's pretty amazing. Uh, in fact, it's interesting because um, um, I've talked. There were a couple of other documentary filmmakers that I know. I mean, some very well-known filmmakers. Penny Baker uh, told me he had very, been very interested in filming there, and they had problems getting permission. And I don't actually understand that because we it, it really had no problem. Now I don't know if it. You know, the fact that I have a physics degree, my partner is a physicist, that helped. But the CERN itself has an incredible media department. They are very aware of the fact that they want to promote um, the public's view of science. Uh, they've had other, you know, there have been disasters in science where scientists have not been seen in the right light. And CERN is actually has no military research or anything. So they're very interested in it. So we got permission very easily to get there. Um, and then... Uh, I really did insert myself. And again, I think because I really had contacts there. I mean, CERN, it's one of these places, it's like this, you know, it, it looks forbidding from the outside. There's security to get in. Um, but it's like a university, like once you're in, like nobody cares. I mean, they sort of assume you know what you're doing. Yeah. And since they themselves document a lot, uh, there, were, there were always there were camera people around. And, uh, um, you know, formally, uh, you need to have a person with you associated with it, but after the first shoot, she just realized, oh, Mark, you know where you're going, and you're meeting people that are important, so just do it. Um, and so she just sort of let us go. And so we did, uh, you know, I think we did an occasionally go to places they didn't think we were going to be and film, and uh, I'll be interested to see. But they've actually seen the film. They, they liked it. So it was surprisingly easy, actually. Um, now, things did clamp down, well, for two reasons. One was, you know, there was the whole uh, sensationalism that it's going to create a mini black hole and destroy the universe. And so they were getting death threats and things like that. And so there was more security that was uh, put into place. But again, I was already in, I was in on the inside. And, um, and people, uh, I was there so long at so many times that they just thought I worked there. And, you know, they, they accepted it. So... It, Ironically, it was probably easier for me than him being in the middle of traffic, you know. <laughs> Brilliant. Anyone else want to, sir? Um, thanks. Uh, I have a, <clears throat> a question about um, filming places in that, you know, I, I'm sure everybody, amateur photographers, have experienced like a beautiful moon or a sunset and then you try to take a picture of it and it disappears and it sucks and it has nothing to do with what the actual beauty was of, of being in that place. And I'm curious if you ran into those kind of issues of just being in fantastic spaces and you had you either couldn't capture it the way you did, you wanted to, or you were able to capture it and, and what that process was like. Sharif, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I mean, you keep saying beauty of the place, and I'm thinking, yeah, it is beautiful <laughs> in its own right. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's... I, I constantly felt like I wasn't getting what I wanted, <laughs> and, uh, you know, things weren't... But again, you sort of do what you can, and you get home, and you look at the footage, and you try to think, okay, this is going to work, or this isn't. Um, yeah. Specifically, were you, I'm just interested, what kind of images were you... Oh, I mean, you know, one would love a helicopter shot of Cairo, and that was illegal. Mm -hmm. So then suddenly, two years ago, there's helicopters everywhere, and everyone's got these beautiful helicopter shots, and I thought, yeah, damn it. <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, the, you're just, you're tied, there's always going to be restrictions, whether it's the lighting or whether it's, you know, your audio. And again, my difficulty was I'm a one-man band for the most part. So you don't have the luxury of saying, let's set up here and let's, you just sort of by the seat of your pants trying to get something without causing too much of a, a stir to those around you. Uh, again, the challenge in Cairo is that there's no such thing as everyone gets involved with everything. 
So I would be filming in a car and talking to someone, and the car next to me would start screaming, what you're doing is illegal. <laughs> Who is he, and how does he know what I'm doing? But there was, you know, it's this, you know, yeah, so. I see, how about you? I was just going to add that I think there's a, there's a lot of not getting the shot. I mean, mm -hmm. always and forever, whether it's a moment that's missed or whether you're trying to get, I mean, we... You know, we, we did try to do actually some aerial footage, but we didn't have enough money for a helicopter, so we tried to do it, you know, with a prop plane and like hanging out, and that was weird, and that just didn't work. Um, you know, we tried to get on the back of a pickup truck and do some kind of you know, driving on the highway to sort of show the leading up into town, and that didn't work. And, you know, so there are things, there are ideas that you may have to. Um, that, that don't work, that ultimately you look at them and it just for whatever reason didn't convey what you were hoping to convey and then there are moments when they, they do and you know it's, it's sort of movie magic maybe or you know um, just, or just keep you know the, the effort of continuing to try to capture a moment and of course with, with film you have the, the wonder of editing as well and the, the compilation of shots and the and music and you know there are many different aspects that can also contribute to a shot feeling and then can, and be the way that you want it to feel and i would also add it feels like an interesting moment as technology takes you know yet another kind of massive leap forward equipment is going to become is now available to us that was totally beyond our reach 5 5 or 6 years ago things like the movi rig gimbals you know which is allowing us to shoot steady cam you know in the most insane places and ways that would have been impossible uh, droning drones i mean we'll all be shooting we'll have all aerial footage like right. everyone was like oh my god enough already with the aerial footage i think yeah. it's interesting i think there are more and more toys for us for uh, for our kind of filming which is going to really help us actually it's an interesting time i mean i in in my case actually i was very conscious of uh, capturing something about the landscape as well. I mean, the, one of the things was this juxtaposition that here you have the you know highest technological achievement in the universe underneath you know areas that sometimes were just fields of uh, cows and vineyards and things like that. And there were certain images that I was interested in. I had the advantage in the end that I was going back again and again. Um, but I, there were definitely things that I had seen that I wanted to get. And it took me a long time. And in particular, I can think of one exact instance is that I knew that there were these fields and that at certain times there was a tractor out there. And I had always had this idea that, oh, wouldn't it be great to see the juxtaposition of this tractor going along and then you see this globe of the experiment in the background. And it took years of you know going back and you know, and sometimes just because I had t didn't have time to do it, but it was just something that was always in the back of my mind. I just would love to get that shot sometime. And we did, eventually. But it was years until it just worked out that we were there. It was the right season. The, the tractor was out there. We could get that angle. Um, and it was just patience, patience, again. patience, patience. you know, patience. Uh, we had another instance where uh, a sort of a symbol of Geneva is this um, jet d'eau, which is this big fountain. And it sort of symbolizes the city. And it's interesting, I had never seen it start up. And I said, well, it, I know it's off sometimes and it's on sometimes. So sometime it has to actually turn on. Um, but it wasn't a formal time that that happened. And it was sort of, oh, it's about nine in the morning or 9.15 or something like that. And you're trying, you know, it's about, a lot of it's practicality. You know, it's like, okay, I have a lot of things I have to do. This is, we had one morning and I had maybe another morning I could do it. And you just go down there and, uh, and hope that it all works out. And, you know, you can't line up your shot exactly because it's off beforehand. You can't say, okay, it's off. Okay, take it down now. You know, start it up again. So, you know, my DP was with me and we're sort of like, it's about going to be there. And if it happens, you know. And, and then, of course, he has to be able to follow it. And, um, and we got it. But it was uh, partly luck. You know, so partly planning, partly luck, partly p patience to get that. I have a question for the three of you. Do you think, I was mulling over this, looking at these three pieces and thinking, I wonder, is it easier to shoot, um, to shoot somewhere foreign slash exotic 
rather than, than them right in the space where you live? I mean, if you think about where you guys live and work right now, your neighborhoods, is it a harder challenge to find the beauty, the symbolism, the resonance with what is immediate and around you rather than exactly this experience of flying away from the city and kind of then, you know, casting that off? And I, I was just musing on that. Or in fact, is the opposite true? That in fact, that I know a neighborhood so well, I'm the only one who can represent it. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, I just wondered if you had a thought on that. It, it, it's complicated. I mean, I'm, I, um, I'm a mother, and I have two kids, and I have three dogs, and I have a husband. And, you know, life when you're at home is very busy, and, you know, you, it's a balancing act, and there are different parts of your brain that are engaged at different times. Um, so, you know, I have thought about stories and films, in a sense, in my own backyard. Um, but, um, but for me, I, 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 you know, I, I, I needed almost to go somewhere, <laughs> you know, to see better and to focus uh, somewhere else, um, not in the hustle bustle of my life, which is very hustle bustly right now. So I think that's, that's right now in my life, but that might be different you know, for the next film when things calm down a bit. I don't know. That makes complete sense. What's fascinating about all three of you actually is that you filmed a place that's both foreign and familiar. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that, you yeah. You both have a past in the mm -hmm. place that you're in, mm -hmm. you don't really, you're not really a connection. Familiar. Physicist. A physicist mm -hmm. connection, mm -hmm. but you're not really a physicist, um, which I find really intriguing. It's not mm -hmm. a question, just a cut. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think as well, yeah, that, I mean, for me, I can say that uh, there there was this, uh, I think it was really nice that I was, that I'm from Cairo and my family was there, but at the same time I was living in New York and kind of back and forth. And that afforded me a certain perspective and, you know, three months go by and you return and suddenly things feel different. And again, uh, you know, I think in any city the easiest way to tap into that is in public transportation, or at least in a mega city, where you just sort of, you know, from the cab ride, from the airport back home, instantly I could kind of sense, oh, this is where we're at. This is what's happening in the country. Um, but it was about sort of taking this thing that was very personal and trying to show it in a way that hasn't, I don't want to say that hasn't been seen before, but just in a personal way, like this is what I want to show. And this is the Cairo that I love that, I, that hasn't been seen. And I'm sure maybe, you know, this is the rich hill, that, and this is the physics that no one knows about, but now we will. <laughs> Let's take a look at Cairo Drive. Yeah. شرش مان وادوس على الخط المتقطع ده الخط المتصل بقى لا بعتبره كانه رصيف رصيف موجود there are rules that we go by if there is space occupy it and it's intuitive في لغه للكلاكسيات يعني مثلا في شتيمه كده بيشتموا بومب I'm interacting with everybody. The <laughs> Even if you're في في العالم كل واحد شل طفل على اجر الام او الاب اللي بيسوق How do you see that? 
the future for the Arab world. More free. Everyone I showed, you know, initial earlier cuts were like, why don't you focus on one character? And I just really didn't want that because I thought that, you know, I've done that and I don't want it to be this character's story. I want the character to be the city, which, as cheesy as that sounds, I really, I needed that to be the case. And at a time when the city is going through a lot, you know, this was this sort of... I didn't know that the revolution was going to happen, but I certainly knew that this was... Uh, a tipping point. And again, going back to every time I came back, I felt that things were getting tenser. It was a little harder to get a joke out of someone. You know, uh, understandable. Life is very difficult for many people in a 20 million plus population city. The fortunes of Egypt are obviously, they will unfurl right. slowly and probably in quite a complicated way over the, the coming years. But the city isn't going to change that much, is it? I mean, it's her essential personality, right? Right, that's what I think. You know, Cairo, El Cajera is the city victorious. <laughs> so, you know, it, it will, it, it, it has been through a lot, it will continue to go through a lot, and, uh, you know, the city, and when we talk about the city, I think that the people that live in a city are very much a reaction to the city they live in. So I'm sure here in Colombia, you know, this is how people live and this is, you know, just walking outside and seeing a red light and no one around and people standing at the curb. <laughs> and I thought, well, this, this isn't Cairo, yeah. <laughs> this is not, you know, there, there isn't this sense of I can just, whatever I can get away with. So people, you know, I don't think Egyptians by nature are this, that, or the other. They are responding to the city that they live in. And, uh, you know, and the people around them and everything like that. Hmm. And what do you feel about it? I mean, are you, I mean, do you look at it and you go, hmm, I can imagine moving back there now as a kind of working filmmaker. I mean, I'm, you know, seriously. Uh, well, uh, I mean, maybe not this year, but you know what right, I mean? Right, I mean, right. like, okay, but let's say, you know, or do you just go, no way, actually, you know, my home and now center of gravity. I feel like I have the gravity. best of both worlds in that I'm situated in New York, but I can go back whenever I want. But to, uh, I do like the perspective I get from not living there full time. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's hard often to keep perspective about your life and those that are living in Cairo right now, for example, it's a very depressing time and people are down and the hope that existed two years ago isn't as hopeful and it doesn't look as... So, you know, two years ago I thought, what the hell am I doing in New York? I should be in Cairo. Now I'm sort of like, <laughs> you know, I'll we'll come and go. Plays out. I'll come and go. Yeah, I'll see how this plays out. And again, I'm lucky in that I have that choice, which most people don't. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm fortunate, and I, I do count my blessings that I can leave and come as I go, as I wish. Mm. Any, please, ma'am. Super interested about what you said about not wanting to make a film about one or two characters mm -hmm. in the place, but wanting the place to be the primary character. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually something that I grappled with with my last film to mixed degrees of success, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to do again on a new project. So I guess my question is why? Um, and for the rest of you, can a place be a primary character without resorting to, or I shouldn't say resorting, but without having two or three one uh, primary human characters? Can you have a collective voice of multiple humans? And are there other films that have inspired you along the way in the way that you deal with uh, place as a primary character? Um, well, I, I would say that 
just to give you a, a bit of backstory, I, the, the, this film is really a reaction to me having worked on two films before that, one which was a political film in Cairo for women that were activists, and it was very, uh, it was very centralized and very focused on this, these women's world. And after that, uh, and because it was political, I was also, there was a lot of fear and there was a lot of, they're watching us. And uh, after that, I made a film about garbage. Didn't think that would be political. Turns out, or I didn't make it, I was the cinematographer, very political as well. So I just, I felt that I had come into this like very zoomed in, um, takes on the city. You know, here is Cairo garbage, and let's just focus in on the garbage. And the reason why was I just really wanted to pull back. And I thought the universality of driving is something that, I mean, I've said this time and time again, but it doesn't matter who you are or how much money you have. You are in it, and we're all sort of equal on the road. Um, with that said, I did, I mean, at the end, you're a filmmaker and you're trying to make a film that doesn't lose the interest of your audience. So I did have characters that I had to come back to, but I didn't want it to be a story about one character. And not to say that there's anything wrong with that, that's just not where I was, you know, that wasn't my initial intention. Tracy, what about you? Did you have inspiration in terms of location-centric yeah, I mean, yeah, We always talked about wanting the place to be, um, to be a character of sorts, but I don't think it was ever an intention to, um, to not um, have it also, you know, very specifically to, to, to yeah. I mean, I think we did feel, um, we, we really did want to focus on the kids that we found, um, and were mindful for us not to overpopulate it. Um, you know, so we were following probably some of the advice that you were getting. That we, you know, we felt like, um, you know, that there were many stories that we could have told, and we really wanted to focus it and be very clear on these kids and their families, um, and that that would actually give us a sense of place through their, mm. through their eyes. Um, so. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to see, um, see your film. What about you? Yeah, yeah and I mean, it's actually interesting. In our case, we very much wanted to make a film about characters, not the place, not the machine. Um, this was actually really a very strong point for us as we did not want you know, this to be a technological film. We wanted what we thought was going to be really unusual was that it was character-oriented. It's all about the people. The interesting thing is that you know, we would do some test screenings and people loved seeing the machine <laughs> and they wanted to know about the place. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it became more important and the machine in particular became a character. And uh, we started just hearing things and literally uh, my editor, Walter Merch, and I would talk about, uh, okay, people want to see the character, the machine character. Uh, the machine is wounded, okay? People <laughs> care about what happened. There was an accident. People care about it. And, you know, talking about the dramatic development and emotional flux of the machine mm -hmm. in parallel to the characters. So we sort of resisted, and it, but it told us, I mean, you know, and people told us they need to see this, you know, you need to be checking in regularly. That's, it, you know, we thought that the machine and the experiment was just the dramatic background to the story. And it is to a certain extent. But it had to, you had to check in with them as well. And because it's this magnificent, phenomenal thing, people just wanted to see it. And they want to see it regularly. And so I had to you know, elevate it to that level as well and then think that you know, I was getting it in the right way. I was just as you were asking that question, the film that popped into my head completely randomly, well, maybe not, but I, whenever I'm talking to filmmakers about films that I felt really kind of almost leave a haunting kind of memory, do, did you ever see A.J. Schnack's film, the Kurt Cobain movie, about a boy, about a son? No. It came out about... No. Okay. Yeah? What was the title? Forgive me, do you remember the na exact name of the title? It's, uh, I think it's about a boy or about a son. Can, can yeah. someone look it up, Google it quickly? It's the Kurt Cobain. I re it, it was sort of extraordinary. It was his voice. It was a you know, beautiful set of interviews that they'd found. Simply set against these extraordinary static tableaus from places that he had where he was brought up and then kind of ended up living and working and it is 
I mean, it, it's mesmeric, and sh I think it was shot on, I don't know if it was shot on 35, but I seem to remember then different kinds of stock for different kinds of, I mean, it was, you know, the kind of the, the visual kind of integrity of it was sort of extraordinary. But it was a mesmeric set of landscapes with this man's voice over the top explaining about a sun, yay. Guys, check it out. <laughs> I was just thinking about places that have really, and it sort of really stuck with me. Maybe it's maybe eight or nine years ago. It could yeah, be older. Yeah, anyway, I, I love... I was thinking about mental and melancholy a lot looking at your film. I don't know if you saw it. It was a film in Peru with taxi cab drivers maybe 20 years ago, 25 right. years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It seems like you, you're in the same spirit of that. Right, right. A lot of people while making the film said, oh, you should watch this, you should watch that. Um, I resisted all of that, and I, maybe I'm just stubborn, but I didn't, I was scared that I would either be <laughs> disappointed with what I had, or I would try to copy, you know, what worked, and so, uh, you know, people, I, you know, I, I shouldn't say this, but Jacques Tati, I haven't seen, although everyone says, oh, there's a very sort of similar vibe um, to that. Any other questions? I'm going to wrap. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, it's not really exactly a question, but um, I just wanted to say that uh, I experience some relationships with place that make me feel really emotional about that specific place. Um, I came out to Missouri for the first time in 2009 to see a friend who I hadn't seen in, in 10 years, who is now my husband. Um, and he said I, he didn't think I would ever leave New York City, which I really, really loved. Um, but when I listened to uh, you just talking about Rich Hill, it seemed like you went through a whole emotional thing when you're trying to describe the place. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the film. I'm hoping I can. i got to get in the queue. But um, <laughs> well, thank it you. seems like all of you have like this emotional connection. Yours um, feels like a little more heart, maybe yours head, and maybe yours just energy. I'm not <laughs> sure. But um, it's just a, a, just a comment that, you know, place does mean a lot to a lot of different people. Some, some people don't get that attached, and some people do. So I'm um, just looking forward to, to seeing how this place moves the story forward. It's interesting to me. Well, that's a, a great commentary to, to wrap this, this session up. And I'd say the other thing that really has struck me, listening to the three of you also, is that word again that kept coming up, one of patience of patience is that you know you don't capture the essence the spirit of a location you know on the fly without thought without intentionality and sometimes just sticking it out and waiting for those moments you know having it in your mind's eye and waiting and waiting and I commend that to you too also as a sort of thought and an imperative in the work that you make please can we give an, a round of applause to these great guys <laughs>